Das Weifar, Kreuzerkigit. Welcome, everybody, uh, to our event this evening. And a big thank you for joining us. Thank you to our alumni, staff, the donors, friends, and supporters for uh, coming to this event tonight. As you can see, the, um, uh, this evening's digital showcase is being recorded, and we'll be able to send you a, a link after the event, which you're welcome to share. It'd be great if you could do that and, and get the word out. My name's Colin Ridden, and I'm the President and Vice Chancellor of Cardiff University. And we've invited you here this evening as part of the um, uh, Cardiff community who uh, are interested in and help and support the learning and research of the university. So this evening's event showcases one of our cancer research programmes. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that, um, that the incidence of cancer remains very high and of course the ability to treat us has been uh, uh, negatively affected by the COVID crisis. Um, and I believe the latest uh, state of affairs is that one in two people in the UK uh, can expect to be diagnosed with some form of cancer at some point in their lives. So this is really important to all of us. Now here at Cardiff, uh, our research into cancer, uh, cancer is, is varied, it's wide ranging and it's um, highly innovative as, as research of course must be. And the research programmes range across a, a whole um, a set of approaches uh, uh, and some of it is un understanding and unraveling the basic biology of the disease. How does it work? It's a very pernicious disease, I'm sure you, I'm sure you know. So it's, it's, it is difficult to unravel that. We're working on that. We're working on developing public health measures and clinical research where we develop better interventions to prevent, uh, diagnose and treat cancers. And all of those approaches make a big difference to the individuals and their families who are, are living with cancer. Now, since 2015, Cardiff University has been awarded over 94 million pounds of funding for cancer research. So it's a really big element of what we do. And that's from government, from charitable uh, foundations and trusts, and from uh, private individual funders. And we're very grateful to um, all those who, uh, who, who help and support our work in this way. Now, this evening's event uh, showcases one of our clinical research programmes, and that is uh, uh, developing a better and more effective way to administer chemotherapy treatment to cancer patients. And I'm sure you're all familiar with, with uh, chemotherapy uh, as a treatment. And I'm delighted that our, our speaker this evening is Dr. Sadie Jones, who's a senior clinical lecturer within the School of Medicine and a consultant gynaecology oncology surgeon here in Cardiff. Uh, Sadie qualified in medicine at Cardiff and she was awarded her PhD from us as well. So she's a homegrown talent. Uh, and uh, Sadie and her academic colleagues working in different specialities here in Cardiff um, are trialing this new approach on patients with secondary abdominal cancer. So this is something that is uh, in clinical trials at the moment. So we'll, we'll hear from Sadie uh, shortly and after that, we'll have the chance for uh, questions and, and answers. We've already received some questions in advance, but if you do have any uh, during the course of the event, please uh, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll try to answer as many as time allows. And we will, I should say, be finishing at 6 p.m. Uh, but for now, uh, it's time to embark on our uh, presentation. So I'm delighted to ask Sadie to uh, present uh, to us now. Thank you, Sadie. Uh, well, many thanks, Colin, for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen with you um, so you can see my presentation. Bear with me. OK, um, so as Colin said, my name is Sadie Jones and I'm a relatively new consultant gynaecology cancer surgeon and senior clinical lecturer here in the University Hospital of Wales, Cardiff. And I am uh, thrilled that you've taken some time uh, to, to come and listen to me talk about some of the new ways that we're developing um, of treating patients with advanced ovarian cancer here in Cardiff. I just wanted to talk you through some of my research interests and how I've got to where I am now, if that's OK. So uh, I initially started in 2015, as Colin said, looking at um, precancerous disease of the vulva, so a condition called VIN. And my PhD involved looking at novel therapies to treat this condition, as well as developing biomarkers to help us understand exactly what 
treatments a patient should get in the clinic in front of you to improve their outcomes. And this is research that I'm still, a research area that I'm still active in now. As a surgeon, obviously, I'm very interested in surgical techniques. And unfortunately, our vulval cancer patients do suffer a lot of sequelae as a result of their surgery. And uh, a big part of my research interest is um, around optimizing the techniques that we, we use to perform vulval cancer surgery to improve the outcomes for our patients. And more recently, I've become interested in prehabilitation. So this is all about optimizing and improving a patient's ability to cope with the stresses of surgery physically and psychologically. And there's a lot of evidence supporting this as, as, as a routine form of practice in cancer care management, but really understanding how it fits into gynecological cancer um, surgery is something that's not well understood and we're developing a big prehabilitation program here in Wales at the moment. But really of relevance to today's talk is, is, is my interest in advanced ovarian cancer. And we are developing a, a research program here looking at a new therapy um, known as PIPAC in the management of patients who have got peritoneal metastases as a result of advanced ovarian cancer. And peritone peritoneal metastases is something that I will explain in more detail over the coming slides. So, Ovarian cancer, for those of you who are less familiar, it's uh, the eighth most common um, female malignancy in the UK and the second most common gynecological cancer that we see. So it's a problematic cancer in terms of its incidence. We see around seven and a half thousand new cases per year in the UK and just over 4,000 deaths per year from ovarian cancer in the UK. And unfortunately, it is one of the cancers that's associated with a very poor prognosis, with only 35% of patients um, living more than 10 years um, once they've been diagnosed with the condition. The survival, um, to go into it in a little more detail, is, is poor, unfortunately, for ovarian cancer patients. And this is because, unfortunately, patients do present with late stages of disease typically. So this is data that comes from the Cancer Research UK website. And you can see that the columns here represent the, the number of patients that are presenting at each cancer stage. And as, as you may already know, that you have stage one, which is the earliest stage of cancer, and it goes up to stage two, three, four, and stage three, four are the more advanced stages of cancer. And you can see here that with ovarian cancer patients, the majority of patients are presenting with stage three or four disease. And unfortunately, the pink dots represent the five-year net survival. So in a patient that's presenting with stage three or four disease, the five-year net survival is, is, is far poorer than if the patient presents at stage one disease. So this is a big problem in terms of managing ovarian cancer um, across the world. But actually in the UK, we specifically have a problem in that we are performing badly compared to our counterparts in other developed countries across the world and in Europe. And this is a graph that was um, recently published in a, in a population-based study published in the Lancet Oncology in 2019, which compares our five-year net survival of patients with ovarian cancer compared to countries like Australia, Canada, Norway, New Zealand, all economically developed countries um, compared to whom you think we would do quite well. But you can see here that the UK is represented by the red arrow and certainly we are not performing as well as we would perhaps expect to compared to these other countries. And this graph further um, explores this, and this looks at countries, um, European countries, and you can see there that the United Kingdom is represented by the purple column, uh, just over halfway along, and it's looking at the mortality rate from ovarian cancer for in 2018, and you can see that many European countries are performing better than, better than the United Kingdom is. So this obviously indicates that there's room for improvement. But why are we seeing this? And this really is a difficult question to answer. I think it's important to remember that survival statistics for ovarian cancer are poor across the world. It's not that some countries are doing well in terms of curing more people and patients surviving the rest of their life without the disease. It's a relative improvement in countries compared to others that we're seeing. And it's, it's probably multifactorial. So certainly there will be a variance in the accuracy of data collection that's used to inform these sorts of statistics. Um, these, th these data come from large population-based um, Data, collector, data collection systems in each country and the, its accuracy and quality is very, very difficult to assess. So certainly that will, will, will be playing some part in this. There's a degree of it associated with population demographics. We know that in the UK, we've got 
um, relatively high obesity and certainly in, with whale, in, in Wales specifically, we've got high obesity rates, higher smoking rates, higher rates of chronic conditions or chronic medical conditions. And all of these are associated with poorer prognosis from cancers. We know that delayed diagnosis specifically for ovarian cancer patients is a real problem. And unfortunately, ovarian cancer is known as the silent killer. And that's because it presents late. And, that, and that's inevitably because a, a woman's pelvis is designed to, to, to accommodate a growing a growing baby ultimately. So unfortunately, a, an ovarian tumor itself is able to grow really quite large before a woman is able to detect any symptoms associated with it, thus the presentation at a later stage of the disease. We don't have any effective screening for ovarian cancer despite global efforts trying to identify an effective screening um, method. Um, and there is, all, there is also variance in access to treatments. And that's something that um, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about in this talk today. Consequently, lots of effort worldwide and certainly in Cardiff and elsewhere in the UK is being made to improve the situation through research. So our research here in Cardiff is around access to um, a particular type of treatment. So we're developing a program of research aimed at optimizing the delivery of anti-cancer drugs directly into the peritoneal cavity to improve the prognosis of patients with peritoneal metastases. And I will explain peritoneal metastases on the next slide. But I just wanted to, to, to explain to you the, the particular patient cohort that we are looking at from a gynecological perspective. Actually, our program of research is, is addressing patients with bowel cancer, ovarian cancer and stomach cancer, because all these three cancer types will cause peritoneal metastases, which basically means spread to the peritoneum. So we are actually addressing patients with lots of, uh, with, with peritoneal metastases from these three cancer types. But of course, I'm going to be talking you to you specifically about the ovarian cancer patients today. So when a patient presents with ovarian cancer and they have these peritoneal metastases, they have what we call stage three or four disease, which as we've already talked about is advanced stage disease. And the initial treatment that we offer these patients is with platinum-based chemotherapy. So that's a type of chemotherapy drug that's very commonly used in, 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 in really many cancer types. And we will combine this with surgery to remove as much of the disease as we can. And at this stage of disease, a, pa a patient will have a progression-free survival. So that means a period of survival without the disease coming back of around 11 to 16 months and an overall survival of 23 to 49 months. You can see this is a poor prognostic situation anyway. But unfortunately, at some stage over the patient's disease course, they will become resistant to that platinum based chemotherapy that we heavily rely on. And when the patient becomes platinum resistant, unfortunately, their progression free survival reduces significantly to three to four months and their overall survival to 13 months. And actually, it is this group of patients that we are specifically targeting with this research program from the ovarian cancer side of things. So what are peritoneal metastases? Now, I do have a sensitive picture that I'm going to show you because I think it is useful um, to help you understand the situation. But please um, do look away if, uh, if you feel that you, you, may, you, you may not um, uh, like to see it. Um, peritoneal metastases are basically um, metastases that involve the lining of the inside of our abdomen and pelvis. So inside our abdomen and pelvis and the organs that sit inside that cavity, we have a cling film layer that is called the peritoneum. And ovarian cancer, stomach cancer and bowel cancer can spread, the cells can spread along that peritoneal layer to cause metastases, as you can see in this top picture and the bottom picture. The top picture, the white plaques there on the inside covering of the tummy wall are the peritoneal metastases. And on the bottom picture, the peritoneal metastases are there on the, on the fatty layer that basically provides the blood supply to the bowel. And what you can see from these pictures is that peritoneal metastases are diffuse and extensive and often affecting organs that are vital for the patient's survival. And when that means that you can't remove those areas and the patient continue with a healthy life afterwards. So this is why they're impossible to operate on. They're far too widespread for that. And also why radiotherapy would be far too toxic because you can't deliver it to big widespread areas like that. 
And unfortunately, chemotherapy that's traditionally de delivered through the vein or through the circulating blood supply finds it very, very difficult to reach this area. The blood supply is not very good and consequently very high doses of the drugs are required to achieve the results that we hope to see. Um, and the patient does often find it very difficult to, to, to cope with the side effects that are then, then suffered as a result. So this is what we're really looking at with this treatment. So we're looking at what's called intraperitoneal chemotherapy, which is basically where, whereby you deliver chemotherapy directly into that space. So you're improving your target specificity rather than relying on the blood circulation. You deliver it directly where to where the problem is and hopefully get better dosing and better effects as a result. It, 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 um, as a, sorry. So pressurized intraperitoneal aerosolized chemotherapy is a form of intraperitoneal chemotherapy, um, which we shorten to PIPAC. So intraperitoneal chemotherapy can be given as a solution or it can be given as an aerosol. And we are specifically looking at this form when it's given as an aerosol, which we call PIPAC. Now, the advantage of this technique is that we can give it at the time of a keyhole surgery. So this image here represents that. You can see the small ports that we use for keyhole surgery which then basically fill the abdomen and the pelvis cavity with gas, allowing all of the, the structures inside to become distended and the surface area all to become far much more exposed. And then the chemotherapy itself is aerosolized into uh, a jet, like a deodorant or you know, a, a spray that you would imagine that you use for other things that you then spray around the abdomen and the pelvis itself, ensuring that you get a nice coverage of all of the surfaces affected um, to hopefully improve the efficacy of the treatment. So what do we already know about this type of treatment? So there has been a lot of research done mainly in Europe and in the US um, looking at if it's safe and, uh, and if it's efficacious as well. And, and, and in 2018, a systematic review, which included over 15, 1,500 patients, a lot of them were ovarian cancer patients, demonstrated that PIPAC itself is feasible, safe and efficacious in the management of peritoneal metastases. The majority of the research that's been done so far is in the group of patients that we're specifically interested in. So this platinum resistant recurrent group of patients, which is reassuring us in terms of progressing this research further. It does indicate that the quality of life of the patient is either maintained or improved over the course of the treatment, which is excellent from the patient's perspective. We do see an objective tumor response reported at 69% on average, which is, which, is, which is good in terms of efficacious rates. And the overall survival is slightly increased to 13.7 months. However, this data is heterogeneous, both in terms of design and quality. And what that means is it's varied. We, we've got different designs of the clinical trials that have been out there, done that have been performed already. And the quality of this research is, is, is quite varied as well. And as a result of this, NICE, which are our governing body really here in the UK, published a statement in 2020 stating that the evidence of the safety of PIPAC is there, but it, it's recognised that it's associated with some serious and well-recognised side effects, and that there is evidence indicating that there's efficacy, but of course it's of, 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 of inadequate quality to, to actually incorporate it routinely into clinical practice at the moment, and that therefore this procedure should be used in the context of research um, in, in its current form. So what this means in the UK is that although this, this treatment is actually accessible for patients in Europe, in Europe and in the US, both inside and outside of, of, of clinical trials, our patients in the UK do not have access for this treatment at all. And our, our PIPAC centres, there are two in the UK, Cardiff here and, and Imperial College London, receive calls from patients and carers every week requesting for this treatment. But unfortunately, since this statement was published in 2020, we're not able to routinely offer it. So this is what we're really trying to address with our um, programme of research here in Cardiff at the moment. So, it, it, you know, in a, a very overview summary type picture, this is what we're aiming to do. We've got phase one trials lined up, which roll straight into phase two trials, which will then lead into phase three clinical trials, which mean that you can then deliver this treatment to the patients, provided the trials demonstrate the efficacy and the safety that, 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 that you anticipate them to.
Alongside that, we've got a comprehensive um, program of basic science and translational research looking at drug development. And this is a constant feedback loop system whereby the clinical trials are testing the drugs and looking at how they're improving the situation for the patients. They're feeding samples into the, into the lab to look at how we can then optimize and further improve things and get the drugs working harder that will then feed back into the phase one. These are the early trials where you, you, you look to see if there is some sign that they're efficacious and, and, and rolling it out in a constant loop. So this is what we're, what we're working to achieve really comprehensively here in Cardiff at the moment. And we're not going to go into this slide in an awful lot of detail, but um, it, it just depicts really um, specifically what we're trying to, in, to, to, to really introduce. You can see here we've got a phase one study where we're going to be doing bi-directional and uh, safety um, research, as well as dose escalation studies. This allows us to really determine the, the perfect dose that we, can, that we can use to deliver the chemotherapy in this way to the patients. Um, and then that, those studies will inform the dose that we will then use in the phase two trials, where we will really look to see if there's a signal of proper efficacy in terms of um, progression-free survival and overall survival for the patients. The translational research Research in the yellow boxes at the bottom we'll talk about in a bit more detail in the fourth, in a forthcoming slide but are really comprehensive in terms of improving target specificity repurposing existing drugs electrostatics um, as well as actually understanding the, mu the immune landscape that the patient has um, in, in this in this particular situation. So the scientists that we've got involved are Alan Parker, who um, I think has um, spoke to this audience previously, actually, um, and he's here in Cardiff University. He's the professor of translational virotherapies here in Cardiff University. And then Steve Conlan, who's the professor of molecular and cell biology in Swansea University. And between the two, we are looking at really improving the drug development side of things. So Alan Parker and his virotherapies, we're specifically looking to see if we can um, attach our chemotherapy drug drugs to um, viruses which are very, very good at targeting cells, very specifically ensuring that those anti-cancer drugs get exactly where we want them to, to optimize the efficacy of the treatment overall. And then with Steve Conlan, we're looking at really trying to improve the target penetration of the drug. So he uses um, nanoparticles to basically make the drugs um, into an extremely small, tiny form. So as opposed to using maybe a kitchen spray to deliver the chemo therapy and um, you're you're looking more like a deodorant type spray to deliver the chemotherapy which inevitably means you've got better coverage and hopefully better penetrance using the smaller particles as well then we've also got strong industry collaboration with Alessi Surgical and this is really quite interesting because they've developed a probe that we already use actually at the time of laparoscopic surgery to um, provide a current of charge within the abdominal cavity when we're operating to ensure that smoke created during surgery is cleared from the vision of the surgeon but actually this electrostatic technology will also encourage the drugs when they're sprayed into the abdom abdominal cavity to settle down nicely on the tissues and again further improve the way that the drug is delivered to the tissues. So um, in summary we are developing this comprehensive research program which we hope means that we'll be able to provide this form of anti-cancer treatment to our patients in the UK um, and, and that they're no longer disadvantaged from these newer technologies, which are showing um, certain promise um, in, in the management of different cancers. And we have a, a really strong, broad team um, collaborating to develop this work. It's a really exciting new area um, that we're exploring in Cardiff. Um, and I would be very happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, so many thanks for your time and listening. Um, and uh, yes, please, I'm um, happy to answer any questions. That was great. Thank you very much indeed, Sadie. Really interesting. Uh, want to take your slide down, Greg? Thanks. Yes, I, uh, I hope I am. There you Just... are. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> we can see you. Great. Well, look, thanks so much indeed. That was that was wonderful. So if you if you do have questions, please put them in the Q and A box, and we'll um, we'll see whether we can answer them. But we have got some that have been sent in advance while you're um, while you're thinking about that. And and just even before we go on to that, just a couple of brief questions for understanding for me. Net survival. 
Uh, I know it's a very, very common term for you, but basically, does, does that mean uh, excluding other forms of death? Yes, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, so, it shows, so it attributes it only to the, to, to the okay, to the particular cancer that it might be. And just another thing for interest, um, does the drug have to change? I mean, because in, in the one case it's injected and in the other it settles directly onto the, onto the tumours and presumably onto the, onto the organs as well. Does that affect the, the drug design in any way or is it just the same stuff? No, at the moment it's not affecting the drug design, um, apart from the fact that it goes through a special device where it you know, is, is combined to make an aerosol. So it's in a, in a high pressure vacuum that basically makes it, makes it into, into an aerosol, but it's actual design and formulation is not changed in any way at the moment. However, that is absolutely, um, you know, that's being researched in a, in a really big way um, across, across Europe and, and here in Cardiff actually, because inevitably, changes in the formulation are going to, to, to optimise it to be delivered from a pipe act perspective. Um, but I think it's really important um, as well to say that, you know, we've got our traditional chemotherapy drugs that we're going to be using in the first instance for the phase two type clinical trials here, but this is going to rapidly change. Already we've got much better anti-cancer drugs, immunotherapies, patient-specific anti-cancer drugs that, 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 that can be um, patient specific based on biomarkers and on the immune um, the, the biology of the cancer that's being treated specifically. So this will rapidly change the type of drugs that we're using to, 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 to treat cancer with this new technique. It'll become more precise, I guess. And Absolutely. Yeah. Just an observation, it seems like a brilliant adaptation. I'm not sure how many viewers are aware, but with, with keyhole surgery, if, if a surgeon uh, basically makes an incision, it's usually with a hot a hot wire type thing which creates smoke and that gets in the way so they can't see and somebody came up with the idea that you basically have an electrical charge so all the smoke just sticks to the abdomen and this is basically taking that isn't it and adapting it yeah. for therapy which is, which is brilliant um, exactly. so we've got um a, a couple of questions could this approach be applied to cancers in other parts of the body for example the breast or bladder or even head and neck yeah, um, I, I, I think you need to have a cavity. You need to have a cavity that you can distend with gas for pipac. So there are, there are um, ways of giving chemotherapy in a solution. So for example, into a joint space, certainly you'd be able to give chemotherapy in, in a solution form, but you need to be able, for pipac specifically, you need to be able to create a gas distension. Um, so certainly for lungs, I would envisage it would be something that could be explored, um, but, but for a dense um, organ structure like the breast, for example, I, I, unfortunately, I can't see that there's going to be a role for this type of treatment. So there needs to be a cavity, that, that's, that's helpful. Yeah. Um, and somebody's asking wh whether it matters where the primary was. No, certainly not. Absolutely not. And, and, and I think that, that that's a really excellent question, because I think as a, as a cancer researcher, we have to move away from this concept of the organ of origin being what's important. It's, it's not about that. That's a, an old fashioned concept that we need to move away from. Understanding the actual cancer biology, the cell type, the way that cancer is behaving with all the immune markers that we can now um, map and, uh, and use to understand the cancer body is going to be far more important i would envisage that in years to come we will not be calling these cancers ovarian cancer and stomach cancer we will be calling them something completely different and that's certainly the direction we should be moving in so in answer to that question absolutely not it doesn't matter but we do see peritoneal metastases more commonly in it with, with stomach um ovarian and bowel cancer which is why we're targeting those population groups in the first instance great thanks um, just, just one more, because there was some in the, in the uh, Q&A now, but I think one thing people may, may want to know. So if, if the results from the PIPAC study are good and the technique works, how long would it take to, to become routine NHS treatment? And I guess coupled to that, from my own interest, uh, it, it does seem a bit odd that other places can do it and we can't. <laughs> Mm. It's it's really interesting and it's something that our team, we, we were at a conference recently in Rome, which is basically the conference around intraperitoneal um, uh, chemotherapy and treatments. And it, it really is an interesting question. And I think that in the UK, we are 
cautious in bringing in new medications and new treatments and rightly so you know that, that that's no bad thing but we do rely on there being good quality high standard evidence before we're going to bring something into clinical practice and 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 maybe the situation is slightly different elsewhere in Europe so bringing these treatments in and getting them going is is maybe a little easier elsewhere which means that they become part of routine practice and then actually it becomes very difficult to run the proper clinical trials that are required to get the to get the treatment more broadly used so 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 that creates a problem within itself so that's when often the UK is looked at or looked to to generate the evidence that's required to actually get these things into routine clinical practice um, so uh, in answer to your question however how long it will take well for the state for the phase three to, to the sorry for the phase two to the phase three role of the study uh, that would take seven years at least um, before that was then used for routine practice. But of course, during the whole of the phase two research and the phase three research, eligible patients are going to be um, approached and offered to be a participant in the study. So it'll be accessible in the form of a research trial in the UK, but not part of routine practice until, of course, we've got the answers from the clinical research. So would that be open to people from all over or is it really focused on Cardiff? So Cardiff, so this is actually a collaboration between Cardiff and Imperial Cardiff are lead, leading it actually, but we will be setting up PIPAC centres in uh, initially in 10 and that will roll rapidly into 20 centres. So we're hoping that we'll be delivering it across the UK. Of course, there's a, a, ge a geographical nightmare, isn't there <laughs> here, but um, uh, uh, certainly we're hoping to make it accessible within reason to, to, to most patients in, in the UK. Uh, and and some, somebody is asking whether the survival figures where it is allowed to be used are strong. I think there was something on the slide, wasn't there, of a mean survival of 30.7 months, but it, it's presumably it's very, very promising, the results from abroad. Yeah, so so they varied. The quality certainly varied, and I think that uh, it's, it's 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 a really good question. So you've got that the range of improvement in survival is really quite significant. So you know you've got studies which are demonstrating that you've got the same in terms of progression free survival and overall survival, and then you've got those studies that are you know indicating that these figures are, are far far better than that thirteen point eight that I think I've put on the slide there. Um, but it's, it's the, the problem is, is the quality, the quality yeah. and the heterogeneity of this data. We at the moment, as NICE have quite rightly said, it, it is it is unreliable. So we really do need to answer this question. But I do think it's important to say as well that this is a, a poor prognostic patient group. And as much as, as, as survival and outcomes is really important, of course, it's really important. But actually, the quality of life for the patient is also very, very important. If you've got a patient who is living in their last 12 to 24 months of life and they're having systemic chemotherapy which makes them feel sick have diarrhea being feeling dreadful for the remainder of their of their of their time um then then that's that's not good treatment you know if we're not improving the situation those side effects you hopefully get at least the same progression free survival and overall survival and maybe better hopefully better but certainly the signal for the quality of life is really really strong so and, and that's nothing not, not to be sneezed at for, the, for this patient group that's a, obviously a very very important outcome of this type of research as well so so when nice refers to um serious side effects i guess by comparison with the the injection method uh, the evidence looks to be that, it, that it's much better. Yeah, from the, from the, so, so it's difficult from NICE's perspective. So this is a surgical technique compared to, to the systemic chemotherapy. So when you have a problem from a, from a surgery, it, 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 it often seems it, it's wor it can be worse, can't it? Because you have bowel injuries, for example, that can happen as a result of surgery. But actually the side effects from systemic chemotherapy, nearly all patients will suffer a degree of side effects from systemic chemotherapy to a degree. And some patients to a really significant degree where, you know, they're, they're, they're suffering really quite significantly. From the surgery, most patients will have a, a day and a night, a day, maybe two days or three days where they've got some abdominal pain as a result of having had a, ultimately having had an operational procedure. And with any keyhole operation, there's always that small risk of there being an injury to 
a bowel or bladder or, or an, an organ when we do this. So whenever a patient will have a, an appendectomy or any operation, they're cancelled for this type of thing. And, but of course, that's quite a serious um, side effect. So as long as those figures are, and it's very difficult to compare like for like in that situation with the systemic and the, and the PIPAC. So again, this research is really going to be about looking at that, at those side effects and that safety and comparing really like for like in, this, in, in, in the patient, patient population that we're looking at. Okay, thanks. So uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a question in, in the chat. Will you only be treating the peritoneal metastasis in the clinical trials or using multiple treatments for the organ of origin or other metastases as well as the pipe? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So for the ovarian cancer patients, um, certainly this is going to be a, a trial of directly PIPAC versus systemic chemotherapy. Um, and so therefore the patients who are allocated to PIPAC will only be getting the treatment um, into the peritoneal cavity for that, that specific, um, those specific metastases. If a patient has got metastases in the, in the lung or somewhere that is not going to be accessible by chemotherapy delivered that way, they're not going to be eligible for the study. Um, now, in the, in the patients who've got bowel cancer and stomach cancer, actually, those arms of the trial are going to be using what we call bidirectional. I did mention it briefly on one slide, but I didn't want to go into it in too much detail. But they'll actually be receiving chemotherapy delivered systemically as well as PIPAC as an alternating, um, uh, in an alternating way. And that's because these patients will often, have, because they're, they're, their tumours of origin are actually um, uh, slightly different in the way that they will metastasize and behave, we need to combine the two drugs at the same time. So there's going to be a lot about safety and quality of life in that patient group um, uh, using the two treatments in combination. And there is a lot of evidence already out there to support that practice, but actually understanding dose um, is really, really key there as well. It looks like quite a lot of complexity, I guess. Yeah, the trial design um, is, is fascinating. It's been by far the most interesting trial design I've been part of developing in my career so far. Um, and I appreciate I'm relatively early in my career, but nonetheless, it is a, it's, it's what you call a MAMS design, which means a multi-arm, multi-stage design, uh, research design, which means you've got patients in, in lots of different groups being allocated to different treatment arms and rolling from one stage of research into another stage of research. So I think it's a, it's a statistician's nightmare, actually, but they're, they're really enjoying the design of it as well. It's all very new, you know, it's very new and, and, and fascinating way to research. Very cost, it's a very um, cost effective way of researching, which is good. That kind of brings me on to another question um, in there because obviously the uh, statistical analysis is absolutely key isn't it and it has to be a well-designed study because that's the whole point you need you need quality evidence for this so can you say something about the, the interdisciplinary nature the collaborative nature bringing in people from different specialities onto uh onto the onto the uh, work yeah, so, um, well, we work closely with the, um, the Centre for Trials Research in Cardiff. So they're, um, you know, playing a huge part in uh, helping us with the design of the trial, which is complex for your average clinician, that's for sure. Um, and, and they come with a team of statisticians and everybody else that comes with the trials unit. So they're a really strong collaborator for us um, at the moment. Um, but actually, the clinical team is, is really um, broad and, 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 and varied. Um, we've got leads from bowel surgeons and bowel oncologists and gastric surgeons and gastric oncologists and same for ovarian cancer as well. Um, so actually bringing everybody together and actually from cross site, because as I say, we are collaborating and strongly with Imperial. To date, I, I didn't mention it in the talk actually, but it, it's um, PIPAC's been delivered in um, 10 patients in the UK prior to NICE's um, statement. Um, and they were delivered, it was delivered between the two sites, Cardiff and Imperial. So we've got a nice series of patients where we've got the safety and the effic um, efficacy data um, published there, but of course it's a small number. Um, so we already did have a, a firm you know, collaboration there with Imperial that we've really built on. And that's been really exciting. Um, the university collaboration is brilliant. Alan Parker in Cardiff is, you know, as probably you know, Colin, um, you know, he, he's got a, a brilliant mind and um, uh, has been excellent in developing that side of things. Um, and Steve Conlan, very, very exciting in Swansea University as well. And I think actually the two universities in Wales coming together with their, with their strengths actually to, to kind of combine is, 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 is really exciting for this piece of work. Yeah, that's where a lot of the strength comes from, isn't it? Just just a couple of last things in the last um, five minutes. So 
just, just to remind us what the different stages of a clinical trial are and exactly where we are at the moment with this one. Yeah, okay. So, so largely the phase one um, side of the research is all about safety really you'll, you'll want to demonstrate that any new form of treatment that you're offering a patient is is safe and um, so you, you you'll run it normally it won't be randomized so patients will just receive that treatment and you're checking certain safety parameters to say yes okay you can proceed to look for signs of efficacy for whatever the question might be so once you've got that safety side of things um, with the phase one type uh, research, you can then roll into the phase two research. So phase two research normally is looking at efficacy. So whatever your question may be, improving safe progression-free survival for ovarian cancer, you're looking for a signal that there's efficacy. So you, what you don't want to do is design and fund uh, a, a huge research trial with uh, hundreds and maybe even sometimes thousands of patients um, that, that actually, you know, it was never going to demonstrate that there was any efficacy. So you start with phase two, where you look for a signal of efficacy. Your statisticians will design it in such a way that they can say, well, look, actually, yes, this is showing real promise. And we think that this is enough now to say that you can move into phase three. So you think the, adv the advantage of the phase two is it's normally a bit smaller and a little less costly, um, but does demonstrate that signal of efficacy. And then you can roll into your phase three clinical research, which is where you're nailing down and you are absolutely confirming that, yes, this is the answer. This is what this treatment does. Then really confirm it. So as everybody's convinced, and then from that, you can potentially start rolling it into clinical practice routinely, but people often want more than one trial. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. We want to be <laughs> really as sure as we can be. As we, as we absolutely, can be. yeah. Um, and just a final one, perhaps, on, on funding. How, how is the research programme funded? So um, at the moment, this is coming from funding. Actually, so the translational side of the funding is in place. Um, not, co not completely. It's... Uh, we're always looking for more funding, of course, everybody in, in clinical work and, and science is constantly looking for more funding, but um, we're funded by re relatively small local grants in Cardiff, as well as a big CRUK programme grant that um, Alan Parker's got. And then um, similarly in um, Swansea University, um, Steve's got a lot of his um, uh, lab-based research already funded by a big programme grant that he's got there. Um, and in for the um, clinical side of the research, we're looking for the NIHR EME funding call, which is a big, large national um, funding body that funds um, health research like this. And they will actually fund clinical research as well as translational research combined, um, understanding that the two are required to make sure that the, the treatments are optimised um, effectively. So we're looking for, it's called EME, which is Evaluation of Mechanism and Effect Grant um, to, to fund this piece of work. And that, that, that's uh, recently gone in. <laughs> so there are the big program grants, but there are always aspects that can be improved, enhanced and so on and so forth. So we'll oh, always... Yeah. Have to yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I have a PhD student that's just started um, and he's currently writing um, grant applications and grant applications to, to, you know, to grow his work. So, yeah, of course. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Good. Well, look, that was absolutely fascinating. Really, really interesting. Thank you very much indeed, say for that and for explaining it so, so clearly um, and, and very exciting, I think, and uh, every prospect of success by, by the look of it. But we're going to have to be patient with that, I know. And a big yeah. thank you to our webinar audience also for being with us. I hope you found it as insightful and uh, as interesting as I did. Um, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question or if you have a question that you haven't had a chance to put, we can follow up with you directly. Uh, we will send you an email in the next few days um, with a copy of the recording and also links to register for... Um, uh, events that are coming up in, in, in the next few weeks. The next event is uh, in this series is on the Tuesday, the 30th of November, so over a month's time. And we're going to be looking there at the uh, impact on women's mental health from menstruation to menopause and showcasing Cardiff University research in this area. So uh, I hope you can join us for that. And if anybody would like to get involved with Cardiff University, volunteering time and help our students or help us to fundraise for our research, please do follow the link in the uh, comments box uh, that you have there. 
So, Jochen Vare Jaun, the Hoyle Vare, thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Goodbye.